Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, today I'll be talking about um, Naxos disease. Um, and hopefully I want to encourage you and inspire you by talking about the history behind Naxos disease and its discovery. Because so often in science we're taught that serendipity is the vehicle for medical breakthrough. It's about being in the right place, studying the right thing at the right time, which counts. But hopefully from today's talk, I can show that through astute observation and from years of hard work, this, you can achieve the same results and help the patients that we serve. So this is the plan for today. And I really want to highlight the pioneering work of a husband and wife team who contributed massively to this field. I'll also um, finish off by talking about some of the lessons I learned from reviewing this literature. Okay, so let's start off with the basics of Naxos disease. It's an autosomal recessive disease, so a genetic condition which affects the, the skin, the hair, and the heart. Um, so these are some of the skin presentations, uh, symptoms. So there's woolly hair. Um, woolly hair is present from birth, and it'll be like thick and coarse. And then palmar plantar keratoderma, or PK. Um, this is not typically present from birth, but it's once the infant starts to use their hand and feet, so after they start moving around for a bit. And I think uh, one reason why it's important to study an axos disease is because we can use these signs in the hair to show something quite serious, which is um, um, underlying uh, the disease. So there's also uh, this arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, or ARVC. Um, and this is the second most common cause of sudden cardiac death in young people. So it's an important thing to know about. Sometimes in the literature, you'll see it referred to as arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, or ARVD. And this is because of these histological changes you can see um, on this panel, that this fibro fatty material replaces uh, the myocardium in the heart. And this will change the intrinsic conduction pathways in the heart, which can predispose the patient to um, ventricular tachycardia, which can be fatal if not treated urgently. Um, it's also unique in that there's this right-sided heart pathology. And you can see in this diagram uh, the enlargement of the right ventricles and these um, arrows showing these saccular aneurysms, so weaknesses in the ventricular wall. For most patients, they, have, um, they start off asymptomatic in life, but from ages like 20 to 40, they'll start showing cardiac symptoms. Um, so things like palpitations and syncope, and about a quarter of patients will progress to heart failure. So it's useful to know about the cutaneous signs because these present a lot earlier. So maybe we can pick up and screen for these patients before um, these cardiac symptoms develop. And this panel on the right just shows the typical ECG changes. Um, so this T wave inversion, but in particular this epsilon wave, shown by this arrow, it's a, like a blip in the ST segment. It's a very characteristic feature of ARVC. And the treatments for ARVC um, include targeting some of these cardiac features. So you can use anti-arrhythmics like beta blockers and also an implantable cardio uh, defibrillator um, in an attempt to try rectify these arrhythmic events. Okay, so now let's turn to Naxos disease itself. So it's named after the place it was first described in the island of Naxos. Um, and it's the largest of the islands in the Aegean Sea, the Cyclades Islands. Naxos itself has a population of about 20,000 people. And about one in 1,000 are afflicted with this condition. Um, and it's thought that about 5% of the population are heterozygote carriers of this condition, which is why uh, in 2018 they started a state-run genetic screening program to try identify and counsel the people at risk of developing this disease. So Naxos disease is most common in this area of the world 
and around the Mediterranean basin. It has been seen further afield, so even in places like India, but these tend to be more sporadic cases or related syndromes, not Naxos disease itself. Okay, so this is uh, like a historical talk. So um, talking about the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, it can, we can maybe take its history back to the ancient Greek time, particularly if we think about the Greco-Persian Wars of about 490 BC. The Greeks used to send these messengers, or sometimes called heralds, um, from the palace to different divisions of the army um, to coordinate uh, their battle strategy. And one of these uh, people, these famous messengers, they were called Philodippes. And the legend has it, like he used to run about hundreds of miles uh, over a few days sending these urgent messages. Uh, to different sections of the army. And legend has it that he ran from a place called Marathon where the Greeks were fighting the Persians. And to his surprise, the Greeks had overcome the invading Persians. And then he ran back to Athens to say, uh, to convey this message. And apparently he shouted, we are victorious. And then he suddenly collapsed and unfortunately passed away. And this is what this painting is showing with Philodippes collapsed on on the floor just outside the Acropolis in Athens. So some people have speculated that he might have died due to ARVC. And you could even potentially say he could have had Naxos disease given that we're in this region of interest in ancient Greece. I think this is a bit speculative. I, I mean, I don't know if you can see from this picture if there's woolly hair or keratosis on the soles of the feet. But it's an interesting thought. And this distance just uh, a side point, this distance between uh, Marathon and Athens, it's about 40 kilometers. So this is where we get the modern day marathon race from, the same distance. So Philodippes was our first marathon runner. And then more recent descriptions of um, this right-sided heart pathology, the Italian phys physician Lacinzi, he wrote about some pathology which mimics uh, ALVC, um, in his book on aneurysms in like, 1728. And also the great William Harvey on the right in 1905 described uh, an autopsy finding which showed he described it as a parchment heart on the right side due to like, this weakness in the wall as I sh showed a few slides earlier. Um, this is Dr. Guy Fontaine. He was, he's a French electrophysiologist and he was very important uh, in the 1980s in characterizing um, this arrhythmogenic right-sided cardiomyopathy. Um, and yeah, he has played an important role in uh, the discovery of Naxos disease too. Okay, so let's turn more directly to Naxos disease. So the first person to uh, identify this association with palmar plantar keratoderma, ARVC, and woolly hair was Dr. Nikos Protonatarius. He was born and raised in the island of Naxos and he's a cardiologist by training. He moved to Athens for medical school and to work and in an army hospital. And then he returned to Naxos to complete compulsory rural training, uh, rural service, I think it was for two years. This was in the mid 1980s. And he came to this beautiful mountainous village in Naxos called Philotti. And it was here where he identified this association. And this diagram is taken from the landmark paper uh, publishing these findings in 1986. And um, Protonotarius, he studied four families from the island of Naxos and identified nine cases of um, palmar plantar keratoderma, as indicated by the filled uh, shapes. And seven of these cases also had cardiac abnormalities. In particular, they all had enlarged right ventricles. And this table from the same paper just shows some of the clinical features um, of these cases. Um, you'll notice that a lot of them had cardiac signs. Um, in particular, cases one, three, and four, they all had uh, episodes of ventricular tachycardia. And unfortunately, this might have contributed to the death of case four. Um, you'll also notice some other features like brachydactyly, so these are short digits and curved nails. Um, 
these cutaneous features have been noted in association with woolly hair and with PK. So this is why they are also um, noted in this table. And this echocardiogram uh, was from the same paper. This arrow is pointing to this echo-dense region in the right ventricle. So this is the septomarginal trabeculae, or the moderator band. So it's carrying conduction fibers to the right ventricle. And this is uh, very characteristic of in Naxos disease patients. This enla uh, enlarged right ventricle also has um, this enlarged septum marginal trabeculae. So this is important to differentiate uh, this from other forms of cardiomyopathy or other syndromes. So the story doesn't stop there, and we'd be remiss without mentioning the contributions of Dr. Adelina Saksupalu. So she's the, the wife of Dr. Protonotarius, and the legend, uh, well, they wanted to find out more about um, what happens, like the unique right-sided pathology in the heart, because in the 1980s, there wasn't much literature uh, on this. So the legend has it that they actually traveled to the El Savia Library in Amsterdam and spent one month poring over the Medicus Index. So this is essentially the hard, line, uh, the hard copy version of the Medline database, so which we all take for granted uh, today, just we're able to access it online. But they apparently spent one month reading in the library. And it was there they came across the, the work of Dr. Guy Fontaine, who characterized the electrophysiology behind ARVC. And the two groups collaborated, and in 1994, they coined the term Naxos disease. And they're also there in the genomic revolution um, at the turn of the century. And they're able to identify a two-base pair deletion mutation in a protein called placoglobin. And this was highly associated with Naxos disease. Placoglobin is a part of the desmosomes. We'll come on to that in a few slides' time. And this led to a truncation of the, the protein as shown on the right-hand panel. And this was also used for a diagnostic test um, for this ARVC. So particularly on this slide, you can see that the reduction in the placoglobin signal, so these, these are basically heart biopsies and using immunofluorescence. The reduction in the placoglobin signal is highly specific for uh, ARVC, whereas non-desmosobal proteins like N-cadherin um, don't change that much between different forms of cardiomyopathies. So unfortunately, Dr. Protonotarius passed away in 2014, but Dr. Satsupalu, she's still actively involved in Naxos research um, and in the heart pathology relating to it. So this is her with the mayor of Naxos, I think a few years ago, um, giving an update about Naxos research in the area. And she also set up with her husband um, the Protonotarius Medical Center in Naxos, which is one of the world leading uh, centers for specializing in cardiomyopathies. Okay, so just briefly to touch on the pathophysiology. Don't worry, this is just one slide. Uh, you'll note, you remember from your cell physiology that the, um, the, the cell has lots of different units which join different cells together, so cell adhesion, and the desmosomes are one of them. And this on the right is just a diagrammatic representation of the desmosomal subunits and you can see placoglobin is part of it. So de this Naxos disease manifests in areas of the skin, um, hair, and heart, which have increased expression of desmosomes because they're under greater mechanical stress. And when you disrupt these desmosomes, you get alterations to the intercalated discs in the myocardium, so the mechanical and the electrical coupling between heart cells which is why these patients are predisposed to fatal arrhythmias. Okay, so just to round off this talk, I want to talk about some of the lessons which I learned. Uh, so first is about studying rare diseases. Um, so I'm a medical student, and they often tell us that common things are common. So just focus on the basic things and leave off all the rarer syndromes in your reading. Uh, but this is not, this might be good for passing our medical school exams, but it doesn't help the 5 to 10% of the population who have a rare disease. 
And although the, these diseases are individually not common, they have a cumulative burden on our society. And then there's this famous quote by William Harvey, which I'll just paraphrase by saying that often these rare diseases, they have a monogenetic etiology, so just one gene defect. So we can study it using animal models um, to try delve deeper into the cell, cellular mechanisms underlying this disease. And we can use that to help our knowledge for more common diseases. So even in the case of cardiomyopathies, the most common is dilated cardiomyopathy. But most of, most of these cases we say they're idiopathic. We don't know what causes it. But perhaps in the future, by using such diseases as a means of understanding the underlying mechanisms, we'll gain further understanding in the future. I also came across in my reading uh, Carvajal syndrome, which is another cardiocutaneous syndrome similar to Naxos in that it has woolly hair, this hyperkeratosis in the palms and the feet, and also cardiomegaly. But this tends to affect the left side of the heart more than the right side. Um, so these patients present earlier. This is also more common in uh, India, so it might be a useful one to know for clinical practice. And finally, I learned to uh, take inspiration from the family. So this is uh, Dr. Alexandros Protonotarius. He is the uh, son of the two heroes from today's talk. And he is a cardiologist and researcher based in University College London. And he's done a lot of work on ARVC. And uh, similarly, um, I started to follow the footsteps uh, of Professor Yasudian, um, grandfather, and Dr. Yasudian, my dad. Um, and this is, <laughs> uh, this is uh, why I'm standing here today. OK, so I want to stop there. We wrote a short article in uh, International Journal of Trichology, which you can read. I've also left my email if you have any feedback or questions for me. And I'm happy to take any questions now. So thank you for listening.